Hi, welcome to Go On The Run. And before we get too far into the video, let me just apologize for the video being really late. Um, besides the usual, I have to work, which is always true. But this last two weeks, I had some extra challenges. Um, huge water leak in the house. Well, not quite a leak. I was foolish and there was huge water damage that had to be cleaned up. And so there's just people in the house, cleaners for the past two weeks, literally trying to dry things out and so on. In addition to that, like I didn't have enough trouble with the whole water thing, is that um, my computer started to get hacked. And the way it happened was that I installed what I thought was trusted software. It was Adobe, um, for the, um, Adobe Player um, install, and I thought that it was um, safe, and it wasn't, and it installed a bunch of things on my computer and started just screwing up with things. And so you will see in the video that as I work through it, a number of things are gonna be probably popping up and everything like that because that's what I've installed is a virus thing that monitors my network communication and everything. I'm still trying to recover from all that stuff. So my computer is a lot slower. So I apologize for that. Um, well, until I can sort of be sure that all my system is clean and everything else, I'll keep that stuff installed on my system and suffer probably having a slow computer. All right, with all that said, I just told you I have this security issue that I run into with my computer being hacked and doing all kinds of crazy stuff on my computer. And today we're going to be talking about security, not the security section that you see here. And if you've been keeping track of the list of things, you might have noticed that these last three are sort of moving around where at first I had Docker container next, but then I decided to let's do security next. But today we're still going to be doing gRPC, but we're going to make sure that our service is secure which is basically that our client and server can talk securely. And so this was already planned and in the works, and now is actually a perfect time since I had this whole security issue. All right, so let's get into it. So we're gonna go into gRPC directory, gRPC. Come on, why it doesn't wanna go? CD into 23. And um, last time we left off in part three, we were doing streaming, gRPC service streaming, and we showed it how you can do unidirectional streaming um, from the client to the server and from the server to the client. And we said, so bidirectional streaming is just combining the two. And we didn't want to show an example of that. If somebody's still hung up on why bidirectional streaming is literally combining the two, uh, but you're still sort of missing something and you want to see an example, just let me know and we can piece something together. But for um, now, I'll just move ahead. And like I say, in part four, we'll do securing gRPC service. And this is going to be securing the channel over which we communicate. So let's jump to the gRCP documentation to try and get a better understanding of this. And I want to say this up front. Security is a huge thing. And whatever I'm going to show you is never going to be enough. And so if you have to do security in your organization or anything, um, it's best you have a professional and so on, and they are gonna have that. If you're not sure and you're asked to do it and you're not a professional, push back and have them have somebody else do it because you can always be hacked or people can break in or there are a lot of things you have to consider. With that said, let's sort of also remember that this is just showing how to secure a gRPC service. So there are gonna be some things that I'm gonna do that I'm not gonna be able to explain now, but I promise when I get to the security section, and we're gonna start off very simple. We're gonna look at just encryption, what it is, um, symmetric encryption and then asymmetric. But that is for much later. Um, let's just talk about now. So if you go to um, grpc.io and you click on docs and then guides, we've covered this already. What is grpc concept? But here is authentication. And if you read this, it's going to tell you about the different ways that our grpc supports authentication. The one that I want to bring your attention to is this section here that basically says gRPC also provides a simple authentication API that lets you provide all the necessary authentication information as credential. This that they pulled out in Fuchsia or whatever that color is, pay attention, credential. They have this abstraction that um, they're going to call a credential, which you can be used to um, say if you want to secure the channel over which you're talking to the client and server or and or you want to secure the calls to each um, that each call and so you'll see that um, if we continue reading that when creating a channel so it's a necessary authentication information as credential when creating a channel or when making a call so these credential can be used for either one of them 
And so they talk about their supported authentication mechanism and basically it's TLS, Transport Layer Security. SSL is sort of um, what they renamed TLS a long time back. So um, people, you still see people say SSL, that socket layer um, security, but we don't really use SSL, the library anymore. We really use TLS. Um, that's going to be weird because you can see me use a command that has SLSS, SSL in it. And yet I'm saying that, oh, TLS is the new thing. Um, but anyway, it says gRPC as TLS integration and promotes the use of TLS to authenticate the server and to encrypt all the data exchange between the client and server. So this part is about channel security and what we're going to be doing today. Optional mechanism are provided for client to provide certificate for mutual authentication. Again, we're going to leave off mutual authentication for when we get into section 24. And then they talk you know, about token based security. And so we'll ignore that and just sort of jump down to the bottom here. And now they're talking about their authentication API. gRPC provides a simple authentication API based around the unified concept of credential objects, which we mentioned that we saw before, which can be used when creating an entire gRPC channel or an individual call. This is repeated what we just read. Here are the credential type. Credential can be channel credential or a call credential. Channel to credentials, which are attached to a channel such as a SSL credential. Call credential, which are attached to a call and therefore every call. And then it goes on to tell you, you can come do a composite that, you know, um, takes care of both and all this other stuff. And they give you an example of how this works if you're using C++. Um, pretty straightforward, even if you don't know C++, as you can see here, but what we're interested in, and we don't care about token security right now, but let's, and this is the token plugin, we don't care about that. We're looking at examples. And so the Go example to show you exactly what we've been doing before, which is how we do a non-encrypted um, or, or un, without authentication connection. And we remember that we had to use gRPC with insecure because by default, gRPC wants to do a secure channel. And this is our server. server. And then this is how we set up for a gRPC um, server. But before we get into this, I want us to play a little bit with this idea of TLS, the secure connection, which as you can see here, this says TLS. So I figure let's start with a simple example. So let's start our Visual Studio Code editor here. And we're not going to start with by copying our code just yet. Um, what we can do, however, so this is what I was talking about. Um, my, so let me see, want to reach out to Google. So yes, yeah, so this is my net defender that's blocking every communication. Um, at least it's trying to. And so um, the only thing I want from here really is my go mod file. So I'll copy that. And for now, I'll come back later. And then let's do a new folder. And let's call it exercise one. And then I want to pay my, paste my GoMod file there. I still want a directory for our client and a directory for our server. It's just that I'm not doing all that stuff we were doing before with protobuffer and stuff, so I'm keep it simple. I'll close this for now. Um, let's close that. All right. So let's talk about our server. So we want to start off with a very simple HTTP service. And so let's do this. And so I'll write the code because we're already 10 minutes in and we still have a way to go. And I want to make this as concise as possible. So I'll speed up the code. And remember, you can always pause. You can literally stop right now and go and see the code that's in the Git repo. So don't worry. And I'll go over the code at the end of this. Okay. So I finished writing the code and you could find pretty much this example. I could have copied this, save us some typing and just copy this from the HTTP um, package it has essentially the same example. So what I have, um, let's look at main. So I just have a optional parameter, which is the address that we can optionally listen on. Let's say the address and um, the network address to bind to and the ports. If we wanted to change that for any reason, we can pass that with a minus A for the address for the server. And this other part is just two lines. We were saying HTTP package, I want you to handle 
uh, register handle function, which is this hello function, to handle anything that you see coming in on this path. So once we start up our server on listening or HTTP server, if you see anyone make a request to slash hello, then use this function to handle that request. And then once we register that, then we just say listen and serve on this address that we got. And um, nil means that uh, we don't have our own handler, use the default mux. Now the only other thing here is that this returns an error just in case it can't bind to this address that we specify or there's some other uh, error. So we can say if err, for example, and we can then say, you know, log fatal um, f, for example, unable to start um, HTTP server, just unable to start server on percent v, for example, right? And this would be the address. And maybe we want to do the error also. So I can do something like this. All right. And so that's like all there is to our server. And in terms of the handler, when it's called, when it sees a request come in here and it's routed to this handler, what we do is we log that we got a connection from some remote client, that's remote client's IP address, um, remote um, name and port. And then um, we, on our writer, we, have to, we, we don't have to, but it, we set the content type of what we're sending back. And then we also say that our, the status is okay. If we don't set a writer, um, the status, then the package, um, this function adds it for us anyway, but it's best that we set what a response type is, uh, what this response status is. And nice setting the response type also, that helps. And here I want to use this fprintf to uh, file. So I have to put this because this is a writer so i'm writing that file so i essentially write back to the client hello so this is printed locally this goes back to the client also but this is more like metadata and this is what the client actually sees okay so now if we open up our terminal now and we go to part four and we go to exercise one and server and then we do go run and we run it like this. We can open up a, not a window here and we can go back up. Well, it actually doesn't matter, but yeah, eventually we want to go to client anyway, so we can go here. And what we can do is use something like curl and we can say curl local post port 8080. And, oh, it, that makes sense. We don't have a handler there. We have a handler on hello. And so there you go. We can see it all. We got back our response, and this is a server log in this message. So, so far, so good. All right, so let me close this. And so this is not using um, security, and so let's write our client. Again, I'm going to speed this up so I can write the client. And basically, I'll cheat by copying most of this, going over to the client, create a new file, minute go. And then now I'll speed it up a little bit. All right, so let's see what we have. So here's our client and same thing. I just have a parameter to par parse the server that we are going to connect to. And by default it's on localhost. But once I have that server, I construct the URL that I want to, or the API I want to reach. And that's going to be whatever the server um, host name is and port. And I'm saying that it's explicitly HTTP. Um, by default, HTTP GET will just do HTTP, but we're making it explicit here. And we're saying that oh, we want to reach this handle um, or this path, hello. And so that gives me a string for my URL. And I pass that to the HTTP GET function and or rather get, GET function, but really it's implement the GET method. And if you can keep this too straight, don't worry for now. But um, oh, I got some documentation there just now. And so I tell you that oh, GET GET function issues a get method to the specific URL and it returns the response. Now, um, if you scroll down and read, it tells you also when error is nil, response always contain a non-nil response body. Caller should close the response body when done reading from it. And so that's what we did. We defer closing the body before we do anything else. So we don't have to think about it. And then now we can read 
out the contents of that. So there are a couple of ways we can read it. Um, we can do something like IOUtil read all, which would read all the data and return it into a byte for us, byte slice. Or we could just do IO.copy and say that we want to copy it to standard out. And we're copying from response.body, right? So a reader and write to the output. And then we can do something like, you know, fmt.printf, and we can say response from server and, you know, something like this. And then um, we can put a new line just in case we don't get one from um, back from the server. Okay, so that is our client. Again, not very um, beautiful, but it served the purpose. So let's see if we can run it. So let's open back this up. Our server is still running. Now we have a client. Um, we're in the right directory. Ah, pin WD. All right, so edit and, oh man, pin WD. And so we can do go run main and we our client once it's finally run, yep. We should see that oh, there's a response from server and we can see that. So that works. Okay, so that's simple, just HTTP, no security. Now let's copy the simple example where it's HTTP server and enable security. We'll close this up, copy it, paste it back, call it example two. I'll close everything here because I've in the past made the mistake of running the and editing the wrong example. Let's clean up our screen here, clean up. Uh, let's go up also to the directory for example two and down to client and same thing here we'll go up a bit down to example two and down to server all right so when we're ready we know we're in the right directory okay so let's close example one and so let's start with the server and for that let's go back to documentation here and so if we scroll down, um, well, we can go to, let's just yeah, scroll along a little bit. And so you can see it says, you know, for control over TLS configuration and so on, it tells you how to create a client and we'll have to configure this transport um, property, but we're not working on the client, we're working on the server. So we want to see how to create a server that, um, does HTTPS, right, um, protocol. And so if we scroll along a little bit, we'll see something here called listen and serve. If we click on it, you'll see it says listen and serve TLS acts identical to listen and serve, which is what we're using already for the server. Except that it expects HTTPS connections. Additionally, files containing a certificate a matching private key for the server must be provided. If the certificate is signed by a certificate authority, the cert file should be concatenation of the certificate file, any intermediate and that, that. There's a lot that we're not going to cover. And we could open the example here and we can see what it looks like. It basically says, um, when you do listen and serve TLS, you just give the same address that we get before, which is the net the interface port and then we give this sort in this pem format pem is i think it stands for privacy in ants email message or something like that, which is just a base 64 encoding there's a lot now remember we have um a section coming up on security and we're going to cover some of this stuff again not all of it but enough of it for this to make sort of sense so the question then is how do you get a certificate and a key and maybe more importantly <laughs> what are the well, like I can say we're going to talk about this later in the next section. So for now, I just want you to just accept that what we need is a certificate. And when you see certificate here for the server, it's an ID. Think of it just like your ID card. When you take your ID card and you present it to, let's say, um, when you go to travel at the airport, you give them your driver's license. Well, you're saying this is who I am. But how do they know that that's who you are? It's not because you said it. Your ID says it. But who issued your ID? your state, right? Motor vehicle department or something. If you're using your passport, same thing. Who issue your ID, the country you're from. And so that's what a cert is. It's information about the server 
where this program is running. And this has information about the server's name and so on. And the server is basically saying, this is who I am. And all that information is in this certificate, like it's an ID. It also have information about who issued this um, um, certificate, who signs it, who says that oh, this server is who it is. And so when you the, a client connects to the server, the server sends it its ID and the client can then look at it and say, well, you say you're so-and-so server, but also the person who gives you this certificate saying who you are, I trust them, which is the certificate authority that they mentioned here, CA, certificate authority. And so we're going to get into this in a little bit well, in the next section. And so if that certificate was not signed by a certificate authority that this client knows, the client will reject it. It's just as if you came to me with an ID and I do not trust who gives you that ID, then I will just simply reject that that's your identity because I don't know who that is, right? I don't trust that person who gave you the ID. ID. The key is what we need for encryption. And what we're going to talk about when we talk about security is this asymmetric idea, um, asymmetric encryption. And that's the idea that you can have a public key and a private key. And when, if one of those keys is used to encrypt some data, you need the other key to decrypt it. And it's really hard to try and imagine how this works. But basically, the server is going to encrypt data with its public, its private key. It never leaves the server. It has to say secure, and then the clients can decrypt that information with the public key of the server. This is the other side of this key. It's a key pair, and that public key is in this cert, and we'll see a little bit about that. Like I said, you have to trust me. There's a lot that is happening here, and we can't spend time looking at it in this video, but we sure certain we will soon, so let's just accept it. So the question is, how do we create a cert for this server that we're running now, which is my laptop, and the private key? Um, this some instruction here so you can go use this to create um, certificate. But instead, I will give you a command that you can run. And so, for example, let's go here to, well, we can actually go, well, here, this is bigger to see. So let's go to part four, uh, part four, and then we're doing exercise two. And right here, I will do, I'll paste this command, okay. So this command might not be, um, might not understand all of it, but it's open SSL. And that's the name of the command. And SSL used to stand for well, a secure socket layer, but SSL, the protocol is not really used anymore. TLS is the protocol. So when you see SSL, just substitute it with TLS. So even though this command say SSL, it really um, is gonna generate um, files and stuff that we can be able to use for TLS when we do the listen and serve. So, so don't worry about it. And this request says that oh, I want to do, I'm requiring a certificate. And this new key says that I want a new certificate and also a private key. I said, I mentioned that um, for the server, it's gonna have two keys, a public key and a private key. The public key is gonna give to all the clients, which is also in this certificate, which you will see. The certificate contains a lot of things. It's how to contact, how to um, interact with the server, how to encrypt information to it. Um, also the server identity and who signs it. And then this is a type of um, encryption, RSA, and how many bits we can use for encryption, 2000 bits um, or 2024. This new says that how oh, um, essentially this new is redundant with this new key because new key actually gives you a new certificate and a new key. Whereas new just says, give me a new certificate. Maybe I have a key already. And no desk means do not encrypt the private key. Remember we said, oh, you're going to create key pair, public key and a private key. Do not encrypt the private key. This says the format of that certificate that we're going to create. Remember I said that a certificate is like an ID. Substitute certificate with ID. It has all the information about the subject, the person this thing is about, just like your ID has all the information about you. I also have information about who gives you your certificate and when it expire, um, your ID and when it expire. This, but your ID could come in many form. You can have a driver's license or a social security card, or you can have a you know birth certificate, or you can have a um, passport. So this X509 is the format for that ID. Right, so think of X509 as being analogous to the type of ID. 
how so I can have information about myself presented in different ways. And X509 is one way in which we present that information. How many days is this ID valid for? 265, 56 days, right? It doesn't matter. We could use anything we want. Um, where to write this um, ID information about the server and where to write the information about the private key. So, right. So those are the two things that we need here to be able to do um, TLS or HTTPS on our server. So if we enter the, press enter, now you see it or we are prompted for some other information, which is where the server that we created this um, certificate for the server, in which country is it located? I'm in the US. Which state? Oh, well, we're going to say my state. Doesn't really matter. So you fill this out according to my local city, right? My city. Uh, organization, like the company, for example. Uh, organization, you, uh, let's say coding or whatever, right? And then the name, like for example, notice here, fully qualified name of the um, host, right? Host name. So my computer name is ve.mv.lorev.org. And then I'll ignore email and that's it. Now, if you look now, you'll see that oh, I have the key file and the cert file, just like I requested over here. And they have that information. Now we'll take a look at it in a minute. Now, if you do not know what the fully qualified name of your server is, simply type hostname minus F. If you're on a Unix-like machine, like I'm on a Mac or Linux. If you're on Windows, hey, I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. Now, um, in terms of the search file, right? Let's say this for file is in this PEM format. What exactly is that format, right? Let's do cert, cert. And so, well, let me don't be fancy. Let me just show you the contents of that file. So my search file looks like this, okay? It says begin search. It's just a text file. And end search and with some text. This text is what is called base64 encoded. Now remember I said that the PEM format is a format for how to represent your certificate and your key in a way that is, um, I said privacy enhanced for mail, I think, or something that it stands for. And this means that this can be sent through email because it's just ASCII. And so that's what Base64 does. It takes crazy stuff. There's no spaces in this or anything like that that can cause issue when you send to an email. And so that's what Base64 encoding do. And when we do security, we'll look a little bit closer and play around with Base64 encoding. Okay. It's not encryption, it's encoding. All right. Which means anybody who has something that's Base64 encoded can just decode it and see what it is. But if we want to see all this information, what we can do is use open SSL again. So let's imagine that oh, somebody just simply sent you this sort that PEM file in email and let's clear our screen and you want to see what it's about. So you can type open SSL X509. Can remember that's the type of search gate we have, right? We, we specifically said that oh, we want our identity to be written in the X509 format. The PEM is just the encoding, okay? All right, so um, X509 is sort of like what information, what fields are there, okay? And then we want this to be spit out as text. And the certificate I want you to um, print out or dump the information about is insert.pm, that's our file. So that's the input, right? And if we run this command and we scroll back up, notice the same certificate that we provided in that input file, it dumped it at the end. Okay, um, you just simply print it back out. Now, what we can do is pass minus no out. And when we run this, now notice at the end, it just doesn't print out that certificate. Well, we already give it the certificate, so now we need to print it out back again. When the client connects, the server is going to send the client this certificate, this exact same set of content, the PEM format that we saw before, right, that you see back here. The server is going to send that to the client, and the client is going to decode it, base64, get all this information, and see that, oh, this server certificate is either valid or not valid, because if the date is later than the expiration date, I'll reject it. If it's valid, then good. I know who the server this certificate is about, because that, that's all here in the subject information. I know who issued this certificate. Do I trust that person? That's the question that the client has to decide for itself. And then when I'm ready to send information to the server, 
I can use that server public key to encrypt the information because I know that if I encrypt some information to that server, no one else can access it because assuming that they do not have access to the private key, then they wouldn't be able to decrypt it. This is how this encryption works, asymmetric. You use a public key to encrypt and use a private key to decrypt or vice versa, all right? If the server is sending information to the client, well, the client already have the public key, so the server could encrypt that information with its private key and the client can decrypt it, but the client can be sure that it came from the server because it knows that oh, in order for me to decrypt it with the public key I have of that server, it meant that the client, the server had to have had the private key to encrypt it. That's why it's so important that you do not let that private key come off your come off that server, leave the server. It's secure. And that's why I wouldn't click on it for you to see it, even though I could delete it and this is not really the private key for this server. Remember, I just run this command so I can run it again and create even more and more um, keys, right? But I'll pretend like if this is really my server key and so I'm not gonna show you, but guess what? The contents of this look exactly the same and it just simply have the word private key. And so I'll show you the head of that just now. And so that's the public key that the, the clients can use to encrypt information to the server. And then here's the signature. We will we'll talk more about signature. The signature is just like you might think <laughs> a signature is. It's basically a way for the client to say, I can verify that none of this information above the signature change. And because the signature is included, the client could compute the signature itself and compare it. And if you get the same result, it go, oh, since I compute the signature over the same information, then nobody tamper with it. Because you can imagine someone take this text and change a letter D in here. And if they change that, the information would be totally different, right? Like, let, let me just show you. I'm gonna go here and change D. And I'll let it save. And then I'll go back here. And then now, let's clear my screen. And I'm gonna rerun that same command again. And notice how it says that there was error, right? It failed. That's um, unable to load certificate. That certificate is bad. I just changed one letter, okay? And so let me restore that and now let it save. And let me clear my screen again and I'll rerun this command and you can see valid certificate, okay? All right, so that proved that is a way in which the certificate can, it's used a signature to be able to detect that all that certificate was an error. Okay, now, like I said, I can show you the head of my private key, right? And you can see it says begin private key. Instead of begin certificate, begin private key. It says what exactly what it is. But you could try dumping the information too because it's um, you know also in PEM format. All right. So now that we have the private key and public key, um, let's close this. Let's make our server um, listen on TLS. So we go here and we say listen and serve TLS. And remember, between the address and the handler, what we have to do, we have to say, we want to use this cert.pem file, or this certificate. Now, because our certificate is self-signed, we have in our certificate information about the server, as I show you the subject, and also information about who signed it. That's what was the issuer information. Uh, that's gonna become important for the client, as you will see. And so we want to do the key, so key.pem, and now, if I save that, our server, server is set. It's already, um, that's all we need to do to make it listen on HTTPS. And so if I go back here and I say, go build, um, I can run my server. And over here, I haven't updated my client yet, but I could use a curl command. So I use the curl command and I'll say, do curl of localhost colon 8080. And when I do that, it says, this curl command send an HTTP request to an HTTPS server. So this proves that our server is listening on HTTPS. And I could type explicitly HTTP here if I want. It's the exact same thing. Curl just does HTTP by default. I can do, now do HTTPS. And when I do this, you can see the server go, okay, when, when I try to do the whole hand shaking, which don't worry about, it's just, Literally, uh, you meet somebody, you shake the hand, and then they give you your their ID, and you tell them their name and all this other stuff. <laughs> That's what it's doing. And so it's saying, you know what? The remote TLS unknown certificate authority. And this message is not coming from our server, really. This message actually is kind of misleading. This message is coming back from the client. The client is saying, I do not want to talk to you server because I do not know or trust this certificate authority. Remember, we talk about certificate authority, right? 
the certificate authority is who issued that certificate, right? And the client is saying, I do not trust the issuer, the issuer or who give you that certificate that you're now presenting to me. And so you can see here down at the bottom, if you jump all the way to the bottom, you can see the, the curl command. We can essentially tell the curl command, uh, the wrong window, let me clear up. You can essentially tell the curl command that, you know what, do not try to validate or verify this certificate. That's what the, the curl command was trying to do. It was trying to verify this certificate. And so by saying minus K, um, and it it's, doesn't verify. But notice we don't get the same error now. But of course, page not found because that's not the handler that we have. We have an handler called H-E-L-L-O. And so if we do that now, as you can see, we can correctly establish communication with the server because the curl here acting as the client accepted that certificate. It didn't verify it because, oh, you say you're this person. You just made this certificate. <laughs> you issued yourself. All right, fine. I'll accept it. So that works. But the thing now is we want to update our client to accept the, the certificate. Now, they don't show you an example here of how to do a secure client. But to give us a hint above here, they said, for controlling proxies, TLS configuration, keep alive, compression, all these other good things, create a transport. So I say, let's start with that. Let's copy this and let's go back over here. And for now, um, let's just minimize this a little bit so we can have some room to work on our client. And so we're working on, let's close this up, part three and for now. And so we're working on exercise two, working on our client, and let's come here. And as we can see for our client, we do issue a get request. So I'll paste that code here and I'll save it. And so if you look, you'll see here, they create a client and use get on it. Well, we do the same thing here on that same URL. So let's do client on our get URL. So we can get rid of this now. So that that's fine. So this part is all about creating, configuring our client. And once we get it, we can issue the get request. Question is, we know it says that oh, if you want a client that can do TLS, you should use a transport. So we already have a transport. Here, the transport has some configuration that we don't care about, timeouts and so on and compression, we don't care about it. Question we need to ask ourselves is, is there something in here about TLS? And so if we do TLS, we see it all. There's something that says dial TLS. If we go to that, it's a function. So that's not what we want. We want to configure a property. And next protocol, that doesn't seem like it. And shake, no. So here's the TLS configuration. That seems to be what we want, right? How to configure TLS. And it looks like it's come from this package, TLS. And it's called config and it's a pointer. So this is the field we want and we need a TLS config, all right? And so let's do that. What I should have done is try to show you our tr client trying to connect to our server and failing because our server is now HTTPS. Um, and so I can do that by commenting out here. Um, da, 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 da. Um, so let's do this. Let's comment out this before we actually get into um, creating a client that we configure with TLS. Let's do this. Let's do this. And empty configuration. Okay. And so we have a client and then we'll simply use it. And we don't do any configuration of TLS. So what does that look like? So this doesn't really change anything from what we had before. So our server is still running. We can do go bill and bill our client. Uh, okay, we have some packages that we're not using. So let's save and rebuild. And so if we do client and we run it, it's trying to connect to the server. And we see that same message that we saw before, bad handshake. No, our client is doing HTTPS because remember we changed this, or URL. But it's saying that, oh, there's a bad certificate. So our client needs to know about that certificate um, who signed that certificate so it can verify it. So now that we, let's get back in business. So I'm going to remove this, uncomment what we were doing. And so now we're trying to tell the client to use certificate um, TLS and configure that TLS configuration with the certificate that it should use to trust the, the server because that's what root CA is, the set of certificate that you should use to trust the server. And so we have a cert pool and so if we do a cert pool, 
that and then we will get a pen certificate so we can do add certificate which adds a cert um, that is in the x509 but we don't have that yet but here is the one a pen cert from pem and so we have a cert that's in the pem format so why don't we use this and this is a slice of bytes so this is going to be our certificate as a slice of bytes so the only thing we need to do now is read that certificate in a slice of set of slice of bytes and we can easily do that using the io util that read file function and this read file function you just give it a file name and it returns you all the bytes of that file and so there you go that's all we need to do is say or the certificate that we want to use to verify the, the service certificate is in the cert file now if this is a bit confusing that the server sent this certificate that, re that remember there were two pieces of information well several pieces of information but two things that were in the certificate was not only information about the server itself the subject but it also had information about who signed it so now we're telling the client you know what read that information about who signed it and that is going to be your root ca because we're reading this certificate in and we're attaching it to the root ca of this client to say this is what you should use to verify a certificate does it make sense this is how we use the self-signed certificate all right now we can also tell the client not to ver verify just as um the crow command but now that we have we've read this file we can put it the bytes in here and we'll ignore errors because we know that how this sort file is in one directory up from the client so we shouldn't have any problem reading it so let's go back over this now <laughs> we have a client that we configured to transport the transport says that it uses a tls client configuration a tls client configuration says that oh i want to modify the set of root ca that you use to verify certificates from servers or anybody you connect to and the serve roots of CAs is going to come from the certificate pool which I create a new one and append the certificate that we have that is self-signed that's all right seems like a little bit more work but really if you read it backward it's not as bad okay and so now we can go back here let's clean up let's do go build and let's do client and so now we have we still having the same issue bad TLS bad service gates huh well we know that all um, what this is trying to connect to is the local host because that's by default local host that 8080 but that is not where our server is actually our certificate is bonded to or certificate is bonded to the fully qualified name so let's see if we change that if that's gonna work so we're gonna do ve at mv that lorev that org remember with curl we said do not verify so that was okay that it wasn't from the same name so now when we do ve that mv that lorev that org 8080 unable to connect to um to port 8080 so what is happening now this unable to connect is coming from here in my error message so is this get call that's actually failing so and we don't see any message at all from the server so it's just simply failing to connect to um thing and everything fails so even if we don't specify the host name and we let use the default local host well now we get a different message we say that oh, the handshake is bad but then we specify the server actual name fully qualified name that we use in the certificate it doesn't connect so the problem is is with our server if you look at our server code by default our server starts up with you know local host 8080 what it really should be starting up with is vee.mv.lorev.org which is the name from the certificate now we could have passed that in because we are um we have this option to do minus a so i change it in the code itself and so let me rebuild our server so in case you run into this issue you would know why and so now our server is binding or listening on the interface for which it was configured before it wasn't doing that it was binding to local host which was the ip address you know 127.001 it wasn't binding to the ip address associated with this um this name and so the certificate has that name and so now if we use our client and we try to connect again notice how we're getting that unable to connect to local host now whereas before we were getting 
bad. Um, this handshake is bad. Now let's go back up now and use the server correct name. And now when we run it on that, notice how um, we get our message from the server. So we are doing secure connection. Now the thing that's misleading about this, and I wish they would fix this, is when we were trying to connect before and the server and the client is saying unable to connect, it should probably spit out a little bit more information about why it's unable to connect. So, okay, so now that we've successfully created a HTTP as server and the client, now we can go back and say, how do we apply this to gRPC? And when we look at gRPC, we see it all for TLS communication from the client side, it's very simple. We simply say, create a new credential from TLS, right? New client credential from TLS, and we give it that cert file. We already see this already on the client side, just give the cert file, and we get this credential. And then with this credential, we can say we want to use that credential for transport, not for authenticating every request or every call, but just for the transport, right? The communication, just like we were doing with our HTTP as service and client just now. And so if we take this, copy it out, well, before we copy that out, let's make sure that we close this off, close all of this, and now is where we're going to go back to part three, grab exercise three, which is the last one we were working on, and paste that in four. And then now for exercise three in part four, we can see for the client, we just saw that what you need to do is before you make that call, where do we make the call to the server? Here we're using insecure. Well, we don't want to use insecure, but rather we want to do this. So let's go back here. And if we paste this, save it. And so what we're doing is we're saying new client TLS connection from sort file or sort file will be stored in the parent directory and it's going to be called sort.pem. So let's make sure that that is the case. Let's go here and let's grab our two sort files. I'll select this guy and then I'll select this guy. I'll say copy. I'll close example two and I'll just paste it in example three. So that should pair, put it in the parent of client and all this other stuff. And so that's good. And so now we should be able to think. Now credential here, this package, for some reason, my editor doesn't want to autocomplete it. So I can tell you that it's here. I paste it here. And so now let's go back and look at our code. Um, so what does our code say? Oh, come on. Credential is created here from a PEM file. Then we have a new credential what we should do, we want to pass it to our dial option, but the way we've been doing that is by, let's cut this out, is by passing here, appending it to our set of options. So that's fine. So bring this down one. And then we're doing dial, which we do just below here. So we just take this out because we are already dialed in a connection. And so that's it. Okay, so that's how we set up our client. So for gRPC, oh, let's stop this older HTTP server and let's go up, up, and then we do exercise three and then we down to server. And then on this side, we do the same thing. CD up, up, then down to three, and then we're in the client. And we could do go build client and this should build correctly. And then let's clean up. All right, let's go work on the server now. So we open up server, we click on main, here, we have to configure TLS. We already have some notes for that. Well, let's go back here and see what we need to do for configure the server. For the server, we have to do something like this. So we copy this, we go back, and let's paste it below here. And so, save it. And again, I need to put this, import this package. I don't know why my editor is not bringing it in, but that's fine. Copy this and then paste it here. All right, so what are we doing? Let's save that. So we create a new credential from sort file and using the key. So this is going to be in the parent directory sort.pem. And the key file, we know that all the server needs a key file, the private key. So that's going to be there, key.pem pem format or key stored in pen format. 
This gives us a new credential again, but this is a server credential versus a client credential. How do we want to use this credential that we have created? Well, we want to use it to create a new server. So what we can do is add it to our options and then pass it to the server. So we can do ops equals to append. Now you may be saying, Farrell, why you keep insisting on growing your list of options when the only one you're using so far is, you know, um, just this transport credential. Well, we'll see later that we can add other options. So I can do, oh, we already have our new server here where we specify those options. Remember this um, is the expand um, the set of elements for the slice into individual parameter because this is a variadic function. Okay, so that's all we need to do on the server side. So again, let's go here, build the server. It's taking a while again, my computer have all that stuff installed on it. And that might actually affect all my program runs. So we run the server and then here we run our client. So let's do a client. And what we have is all sub connection are transient failure, da, 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 da. X509 certificate is valid for ve.mv.lorev, blah, 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 right? So what this is telling us is that we're trying to connect to a server using the wrong host name. And that makes sense because in our client, what is the host name that we're trying to use? The default host name is localhost. That's incorrect. We learned also before for the server, we cannot be binding to localhost, but rather to the name that's in the server, which is our fully qualified name. So let's try this one more time. Go build. And let's do go build over here too. And then we will clean up and we'll run our server again, knowing that our this time it's bounded to the correct host name. Now we should have put some message in there so we can see right away that immediately a log that is binding to the correct thing. And then we run it and we can see this. At RPC call fail. Ah, unavailable description. Transport is closing. Don't get hacked. All right. Um, well, I didn't really get hacked so much as I install untrusted software. All right. Um, bad software. So, okay. So this, if you look now, you'll see that uh, before when I ran the same program, it closed immediately. This time I ran it, I got one of my operation, which and I didn't change anything. All I did was added log message. And so this randomness where sometimes it's connect and sometimes it doesn't connect is coming from the fact that I have all those um, security stuff running. So how do I know that? This first operation is successful. The second one says it's fail. So I'll do this. I'll simply build my client for Linux. So I'll say go OS equals to Linux and then do build. Then I'll do the same thing here and I'll say um, go OS equals to Linux and I'll say go build. And now that that's built, um, what I can do then is copy both of these. So let's go up to example three and I'll do SCP and I'll copy my client and my server, which is already built for Linux to my server host. And there I am on that Linux box. And here is my client and server. And so if I run the client, the server, for example, it should be running. Oh, but it needs that pem file. It doesn't have the pen file, unable to start gRPC server, but it cannot assign requested address. Oh, there's a good chance that my certificate, oh, is not correct. So what I need to do is create a certificate on this server. So um, I'll do that by using a very quick method of creating a certificate. Uh, so let me do this. Let me do minus uh, make directory awesome app. Let's call it. And I'll move client and server into this awesome app directory. And so. All right, um, let me see apps. Okay, I'll make it actually apps. The reason why I'm doing this is because if you remember, our client and server expect to find this certificate in the parent directory, okay? So I could have put them in this directory and then put the certificate in the parent. So anyway, so this is going to 
recreate that same certificate that we talked about, but only for this server. And notice I'm passing all that information that we were prompted for, prompted for before, my country, my state, and all this other stuff, and the server name. So all that is written out to the private keys and the PEM file, the certificate is in the cert file. So when I run the client, if I go to this client directory or server directory, if I go to the apps directory and I run server, it should be able to, oh, can okay, bind to this port because well, um, so address is, let me see, host name, which is the host name of this server. And then let's do port, not 980,000, but 9,009. Let's do that. And let's see if you can listen. So it's listening on that port. Now I need to connect again. And this time, awesome app, um, that apps, and I'm going to run the client. But this time I have to specify that the server I want to connect to is this host name minus S. Remember, this is just a command to get the host name because I don't want to get the whole host name, type the host name lazy. And then the port where the server is listening. And then as you can see, it works correctly. So the issue was really on my computer with all that security stuff running. And we can see that how we have our divide, add and all that sort of stuff. And so this is a secure communication between um, our client and our server using TLS transport. Let's just make sure that nobody can spy on what we're sending to our server, all these messages back and forth, all the streaming stuff, all that stuff still work. I mean, we can still specify the stuff we specified before, which is the count, you know, of five, for example, and all that stuff still work. So hopefully, I know this took a little while. I wanted to show you, show you some of the problems so that if you run into it, you know why, for example, our client couldn't connect to our server when you didn't see any error messages and stuff like that. This last one, I suspect this was going to happen because of the security stuff I'm running and it's blocking communication. Um, but the first one worked, so that told me at all uh, everything was working. Okay, take care and let me know if you have questions or concerns or suggestions or any of that sort of thing. If you're watching this video, you like it, you like what you've seen and you're not subscribed, please subscribe, spread the word. All right, bye, have a great day.